are jumping into the last and final week of our prophet series. And really what we've been doing is looking at different Old Testament prophets and their message for the people at that time and seeing what we can learn from it today, which I actually think is pretty impressive and just cool that this message was thousands of years ago, but yet we can still apply it to our life today and be encouraged. It it just shows the power of God's word and how timeless it is. Um, and so rich. And so today we're going to be looking at the Old Testament prophet, uh, uh, Deborah. Are you ready for this? Are you with me today? Uh, before we pray, I just want to remind you, we got um, app uh, on the app. There's notes you can follow along with um, during this message with the scriptures and the main points. We also have devos that you can take. And each day there's a devo written off the message. We do this every week. Our staff works on this. And it really is just to bless you and help you. So take advantage of that if you can. But uh, let's just bow our heads and pray over the word today. God, we love you so much. We are just so Uh, blessed to be in your presence this morning. We celebrate the life change and the testimonies we heard, Lord. And God, we just ask and invite you in as we uh, finish through service this morning that you would just speak to us. And God, I pray for uh, this message today that it would uh, uh, evoke a perspective shift in our lives, that you will build faith today and a boldness today that we can remember who you are, God, and, and all you've done for us. So Lord, just meet us in this place today, God. We love you, Lord, and in your precious name we pray. Amen. We're going to be jumping into the Judges chapter 4. We're going to look at that chapter today. And this is the time of Judges. And what we see during this time is a lot of ups and downs for the Israelites. Uh, Previously, before this chapter, they had a leader named Ehud, and they had 80 years of peace under him. It was great. Things were going really well. But sometimes what happens when life is going good and easy and peaceful is people get a little too comfortable, right? They get a little too complacent, and complacent can lead to compromise. And compromise will eventually lead to rebellion against God. I like to think about it like this. Think of still waters, right? We think of still waters as peaceful and calm and nice, But do you know what happens to still waters after it stays still for too long without any movement? It can actually become a prime breeding ground for bacteria and fungus, right? Like if it's left untreated, stagnant water can actually start having some very dangerous disease. It becomes toxic. This is why for those of you that have pools, what do you have to do to your pools? You got to put chemicals in right, to keep them uh, so that you don't get a bacteria infection every time you go swimming and you, like, start growing a third arm or something. You have to treat it, right? And and I actually thought this was a great example for our spiritual life because sometimes it's when things are good, when life is calm for a while, that we stop pouring in the things that purify our spirit, like God's presence and his word and the Holy Spirit. And then what happens, it can leave us vulnerable to becoming stagnant and apathetic and complacent in our devotion to God. Before we know it, what was once healthy and pure has become putrid in our spirits, And it can become a greeting ground for unhealthy things. This is the pattern we see the Israelites follow through the book of Judges. After 80 years of peace, they became stagnant and complacent. And then it starts with a little idol worship here, a little pagan practices here. And then they're in complete and total rebellion against God. So we're going to start in Judges chapter 4. Now you know the backstory. And we're going to go through this chapter. Read along with me um, with your Bibles or follow on the screen. But starting in verse 1, Judges chapter 4, it says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Hirosheth Hagoyim, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried out to the Lord for help. When I read through Judges, it's honestly overwhelming, not because of how many times the Israelites reject God, but how many times God takes them back. 
It helps me understand some of the verses we see through the Old Testament where they refer to the nation of Israel like an adulterous wife. Because over and over again, they would reject and leave God and go worship false gods. But yet still, while Israel would keep giving up on God, he would never give up on them. And he would take them back over and over again. I think that's the same message that maybe somebody in here needs to hear. No matter how far you get from God, he's ready to welcome you back. There is nothing you can do that his love cannot cover. We serve such a good and gracious God. So after 20 years of them being far from God, they cry out to him. And he responds, verse 4, it says, Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lepidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She, she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. So we have Deborah here, the prophet of God. Uh, during this time. And really what that means is she was the mouthpiece for God. She would speak on God's behalf. He would give her a message, a revelation, a direct command, guidance, or correction. And then her job was to give that word to the people. She was also in a unique position we see as the judge of Israel as well. And the only other person we see with that dual role of prophet and judge in scripture was Samuel. But she tells Barak, the army commander, okay, it's time to fight. She tells them exactly what to do. Get 10,000 men from these tribes, lead them to this place. Um, Sister and his army are going to be there, and I will give you victory. This is how Barak responds to her in verse 8. He says, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. I feel like that is a similar sentiment to, to my toddler a lot of times. <laughs> Am I right? If you come, I'll go. Now, this is an interesting statement from Barack, and it doesn't make him look great. He gets kind of a bad reputation for being like this wimp, like he won't go into battle. But I want to note that Barack is listed in Hebrews 11 as one of the heroes of faith. He's listed in the same sentence as Gideon and Samson and David and Samuel. So I don't think that Barak's condition to go into battle was a sign of how weak he was. I think it actually shows us how strong and formidable the enemy was. This is an example like, if Barak is scared, we're all scared. You know, like, have you ever been in a situation where you were really worried, but somebody else wasn't who knows a lot more than you? And then you're like, well, if they're not worried, we're good. Or the, or, or the vice versa, where you weren't worried, and then you look at somebody who knows a lot more than you, and then you're like, wait, if they're worried, now I'm really worried. <laughs> like, like several years ago, uh, the Rimpel family, we were in Cancun, and we decided we were going to do a, an excursion, a zip lining excursion that we bought from a guy on the side of the road. So... <laughs> This is, story's already off to a great start. And they pick us up in an unmarked van and they drive us deep into the jungle, which was another very comforting sign. And they get our harnesses on. And I just want to note that I know this was about six and a half years ago because I was pregnant with my first child. They get us in harnesses. And I remember looking at the wall of safety helmets that they did not give us thinking those must be decorations, I guess. And so off we went. We started ascending up to the first platform with no safety helmets. And uh, as we're ascending up, it starts downpouring. A tropical storm hits. Thunder, lightning. And I'm thinking, surely this is going to get canceled uh, because this just makes sense, right? But I look at the tour guide, and he looks calm as can be and says, who's first? And somehow, out of the whole Rimple family, guess who gets pushed to the front of the line? Me. Now, in their defense, they did not know I was pregnant, because you're all probably thinking, what? Wow. I was very early on. Nobody knew. Well, one person knew who was on this trip. <laughs> one person did know, actually. I'll let you figure out who it was. 
that would know. And I remember standing on that platform, and I'm like, I'm about to launch into the jungle on a metal cable in a thunderstorm. This doesn't seem like a good idea. But I looked at that tour guide, and he just looked happy as can be. So I thought, off I went <laughs> through the jungle, and I'm here to tell about it. It's just amazing, right, how we can be influenced. Barack being scared probably showed the whole Israelite nation, we have something to worry about. This guy was a warrior. He was the leader of the army. And scripture points out that the enemy army had 900 chariots. And this is important. This is mentioned because iron chariots at this point were a very sophisticated and impressive military equipment. This was far beyond anything the Israelites had. And it was known to strike fear in them. You know the saying, don't bring a knife to a gunfight? Okay, this is how the Israelites felt. The chariots were the guns, and they had knives. Uh, they were so overwhelmed with the idea of facing this impossible enemy. And so Barak is actually pretty honest and realistic about his assessment of the enemy. But here's the problem. He was looking at the enemy through his human perspective and not through God's word. And so his response to Deborah's direction from God showed that he feared the enemy more than he believed God's words. So he puts a condition on his obedience. He says, I'll be obedient if. What we're really saying when we do this is, I'll give you what you want, God, if you give me what I want. This isn't obedience or surrender. This is a power struggle. And one that we often get into with God, we say, God, I'll forgive if I feel like I can. I'll be joyful when things are going well. I'll be joyful when I'm not single anymore. I'll be joyful when my spouse treats me like I, sh I should be treated. I'll be joyful when I get that promotion. I'll be generous when I make more money. You see, we put conditions on God's commands all the time. Barack said, I'll go if, I'll be obedient if. Maybe, maybe he had more faith in Deborah's influence with God than with God himself and this is something we can do as humans as well. We can misplace our faith because it's easy to put our trust in the visible person in front of us. It takes a lot more faith to trust an invisible God. And sometimes we can do this even with great men and women of faith. We can put our, our trust in them, our faith in them, and they might be used greatly by God, but they still do not deserve our faith because they might be heroes of the faith, but they are still human heroes and they cannot burden that on their shoulders. Brock wouldn't go without Deborah because for him, he thought that would in ensure the victory. And I love Deborah's response in Judges 4 9. She just unflinchingly goes, Certainly I'll go with you. I, I imagine her being like, I told you we're going to win, so let's go, let's do this. She says this in verse 9, though, but because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. And so we see Barak's condition on his obedience. Deborah prophesies and lets him know that he wouldn't be the one to personally get to defeat Sisera. Basically, what's happening is he's missing out on this opportunity because of his lack of faith. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. In verse 10, it says, There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Verse 11, now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched, pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananin near Kadesh. This is a random note that's going to make sense at the end. Verse 12, when they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Hirosheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River all of his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. And then verse 14, this is really important. Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? Imagine Barak getting ready for battle, and he's seeing the massive Canaanite army assemble, and he's seeing how vastly outnumbered he is, vastly outtrained. This was a David and Goliath kind of moment. It's a moment that doesn't make sense in our logic, in our human understanding. He's definitely going, the math is not mathing here, God. I don't know how we can beat this enemy. And this is often how we face 
how we feel when we face enemies of this world and obstacles and trials and persecutions and struggles. In our human understanding, we go, I don't know how I'm going to overcome this. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. It's too big. It's too hard. I'll never get through this pain. I'll never get through this hurt. I'll never let go of this thing that seems to hold a grip on my life. And the word that Deborah gives Barack is, I believe the word that we need to hear today. Has not the Lord gone before you? Has not the Lord gone before you? I think this word is really important for those of you that find yourself in the midst of a transition. Because transitions is a a really uncomfortable time of life. We have a season that is ending and a season beginning, and often in that transition zone, we have to let go of something to grab a hold of something new. Sometimes we don't even know what we're grabbing a hold of. It's it's unknown, it's uncomfortable, it feels out of our control. And in this transitional zone, we can feel very shaken and worried and overwhelmed. It's similar to the Israelites when they were standing at the Jordan River about to cross and go take the promised land. This moment that they've been waiting for for years. And right before this moment, Moses tells them, and by the way, I'm not going with you. Imagine this. Think of this. Moses was the only leader they knew. And just at this pivotal moment in their future, this pivotal moment where they were going to have to go and fight and overcome, their leader says, yeah, and by the way, I'm done. You got to go without me. This would have shaken them. This would have overwhelmed them. This would have probably brought fear into their hearts. And he tells them this in Deuteronomy 31. He says, be strong and courageous. He says, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. And then verse 8, what does he say? The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. These are the moments that we have to remind ourselves, like Moses reminded Joshua and Deborah reminded Barak that he is the one who goes before us, that he will not leave us nor forsake us, that it's not Deborah who's going to make it possible or Moses or even ourselves, but it's the Lord who makes it possible. He goes before us. And I, I really believe if we can get that truth into our spirit And really believe that, that it will change our perspective and how we face everything in this world. It will change how we live because when we really understand what it means that he goes before us, everything shifts. You see, what it means, think about this, that he goes before us, what he's saying is that he clears the path for us. I want to read you Isaiah 54, 55 too. Listen to this. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I love that sentence. He levels the mountains. Some of you that are facing mountains right now, maybe write that down. He levels mountains. Isaiah 45, 2. You can put it on your mirrors, your screens, a phone saver, maybe get it as a tattoo. I don't know. He levels mountains. (laughs) It's such a beautiful picture that when you stand before that obstacle and it feels impossible and overwhelming that God goes before, he clears the path and he makes it possible. He levels the mountain. Let me show you a picture of what's considered the scariest, most dangerous hike in the world. Because sometimes I think pictures can help us. Okay, look at this hike. This is a mountain in China and it's literally called the Death Trail, which seems appropriate. And you basically walk on the side of a mountain on these boards. They say in some places there's boards missing and and there's rusty chains along that basically is what holds you up. There's no official death statistic, but it's rumored that over 100 people die on this hike a year. So I was thinking we could start a new Rim to Him group, our hiking community group, uh, and do the death trail. How does that sound? (laughs) It'd be like... (laughs) <laughs> rim to him, it's like rim to him, like you are going to meet Jesus for real face to face at the end of this hike. I'm sure we'll get lots of signups for that. 
But I wanted to give you a visual of, a, of an impossible hike to show you in your head what it feels like sometimes, the things we face, the obstacles, the unexpected diagnosis, the hurt, the betrayal. These are the mountains in our life that we think, how will I ever make it through this? And yet, he says he levels mountains. He makes the impossible path possible. We serve a God who goes before us, who clears the way. And when he goes before us, it means that he also knows what's ahead, which is very different than us. I think about God's perspective versus our perspective is like the difference between watching the news versus watching the history channel. Like our perspective is like watching the news, right? You're, you don't know what happened until you watch the news. You sit down and you're like, whoa, that happened today? Crazy. Woo -woo, breaking news, right? But God's perspective, it's like watching the history channel. Even our tomorrow is like watching the history channel for him. Right? When you watch the history channel and you're watching a World War II documentary, you are not on the edge of your seat about who wins. You know, right? It's history. That is God's perspective of your life. Nothing shocks him or surprises him or takes him off guard. He's already gone ahead, which means he knows exactly what you need. Matthew 6, 8 says, for your father knows what you need before you even ask him because he has gone before. That should bring us comfort in our spirit. When he goes before, you know what he's doing? He's preparing your victory. Did you notice before Barack ever steps into battle, Deborah tells him, you will have victory. So that they could step into battle already assured of what the outcome would be. And now on the other side of the cross, we have the same assurance because Jesus Christ has gone before us to the cross. He has conquered sin and death. And because of that, we are confident in our victory as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we go into battle, we can know the victory is ours. When we realize that there is no obstacle or struggle or mountain in our path that compares to the power of the cross, it changes how we live. It, it changes how we fight. When you go into battle knowing that you're gonna win, you fight differently. You fight as a victor. Now, it still will take you to having courage, and you still have to step out in faith, and you still got to pick up the sword, but, but you fight with a confidence that you are victorious in Jesus Christ, that you are an overcomer, and that there is nothing in this world that can undo the power of the cross. He prepares the victory for us. And just as Barack said, or just as Deborah said to Barack, he had victory that day. It says in verse 14, so Barak went down to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And at his advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and, chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as the Herosheth Hagoyim. And all of Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. And here's the interesting thing is, in the next chapter, Judges chapter 5, Deborah, it's called Deborah's Song. She writes a song about this. So apparently she's a prophet, judge, and songwriter. <laughs> and it must be nice to be so talented, you know? <laughs> she writes this song, and we get a little detail about this battle in verses 4 and 5 and verse 21. Apparently, the Lord sent a flash flood during this battle. And what happened in the flash flood, we can assume is that the ground got very muddy. And I can imagine that the muddy conditions made the chariots of iron a hindrance instead of a help. That perhaps they were actually stuck like sitting ducks as the Israelites advanced and easily destroyed them. Here's what's cool. The Israelites thought those chariots were gonna be the, the enemy's greatest advantage, but God flips it. And what they thought was the enemy's greatest advantage became their greatest advantage. Well, God took the thing 
that they thought held the most power over them, and he used it to remind them that it's still nothing compared to his power. God took the thing that they thought would destroy them, and he used it to deliver them. Do you see how God goes before, and he makes the way, and he knows exactly what you need even more than you do? He has gone before. He has prepared our victory. He can level the mountains. Thank you, Jesus. What a powerful truth that if we can grab a hold of, we'll change our perspective, amen? Change how we face every obstacle and struggle and trial. And I don't wanna leave you today without finishing this story. I wanna read the rest of this chapter. Verse 17, it says, Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael. So every one of his men died, but the leader, Sisera, gets away. Fled to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Do you remember the mention of the Kenites? They were camped nearby the battle, this family. Because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened up a skin of milk and gave him a drink. She's like, I got something better for you, and covered him up. And then he says, stand in the doorway of the tent, he tells her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in there, say no. She's probably like, sure. (laughs) Okay, prepare yourself for this next verse. It's about to get a little HBO on us. (laughs) Verse 21, but Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through the temple into the ground and he died. I love that scripture really points out that he died in case you were not sure (laughs) of the outcome of a tent peg through the head, he died. Just then, Barak came by and pursued a sister, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I'll show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay sister with the tent peg through his temple, dead. <laughs> Again, in case you missed it, he's dead. <laughs> Verse 23, on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. They went on to have 40 years of peace after this. And I think there's a few interesting things we can learn from this character of JL. Uh, I love that one, she used what was in her hands. She was a tent dweller, nomadic people. She was very skilled at putting up tents. And so she just used what she knew. She didn't pick up a sword or a spear. She used what was in her hand. I think the lesson for us is what has God put in your hands and how can you use that to fight the enemy? I also love that she decided to not stay neutral. She was technically, her family was neutral in this fight. Uh, They weren't fighting for either side, but at some point she decided she wasn't gonna stay neutral and that she was gonna side with God's people. I think that's a word for us today in our world is we cannot stay neutral. We cannot play both sides. Too many Christians want to follow God, but they also want to be loved by this world. And the truth is, is that we have to decide who we're going to fight for. We have to pick a side. Scripture says that he spits out lukewarm water, be hot or cold, be in or out, he says. There is no playing both sides. Pick a side. And then she takes action. Did you notice that She invited Sisera into her tent. It wasn't that he snuck in and then she was shocked and was like, oh my gosh, now what do I do? She invited him in. And I love this because she was not playing defense on this one. She was playing offense. We need believers who are ready to play offense and take some ground for the kingdom of God to take action, to impact the kingdom of God, to 
to see souls being saved, to not just be on the defense all the time, but say, let's go, let's fight, let's win souls for Jesus. We gotta pick a side and then we gotta join the fight. And the last thing is this, she puts to death the enemy in her tent. In other words, she finished the job. There are things maybe in your life that are not of God, maybe in your relationships or your marriage, maybe in your thinking and your thought pattern. And too many people are satisfied with letting those things stay. It's kind of like you're satisfied with the enemy sleeping under your roof. And it might even feel manageable, like, oh, this is fine, it's not a big deal, I'm getting through, but the enemy is still under your roof. JL could have stopped at putting the enemy to sleep, but she decides she needs to finish the job. Are you willing to put to death the enemy that is in your life to finish the job? To say, I'm gonna do what it takes to get out that sin, to get out that bad attitude, to work on this hurt or this forgiveness or whatever thing you have let become too comfy in your life? Are you willing to do what it takes? And I get that this illustration is violent <laughs> and gory. And I was thinking, man, is this, is this too much? But I, I just felt like, you know what? This actually speaks to the intensity and the seriousness for us in our life to let the enemy in any way take ground in our homes and in our life. And that we have to get serious about removing the things that are not of God from our life. So I ask you again, are you willing to put to death the enemy in your tent? Are you willing to do what it takes to remove the things that are not of God from your life? To pick up what he's put in your hand and take action.